there's no one that lives in Chilean or Kettle Falls or wherever you're from or here in between there that God has his hand against that God wants to go to hell. God wants everybody to be saved. He proved that on the cross. And he, he proved that everybody is worth the value of being saved and offered that. So don't think for one second that there's somebody here that's like, oh my gosh, I've been talking to that person my whole life and they're still not serving God. Well, in, in the last month, I've also, I just remembered this one, uh, there was a, a lady at our church, so if you know who she is, her husband came to the Lord about two months ago, 81 years old, and um, had nothing to do with God his whole life. And the church, um, before we merged, and the family and friends prayed for him for 30 plus years, and went to the hospital on his way to his deathbed, and, and in Spokane, he had brain tumor, they were going to take it out. I mean, all sorts of stuff was going on, and it was kind of his last hurrah. And God came and visited him at night and showed him the darkest possible pit in the world where he lived, and then showed him his light, the light of Christ. He gave life to the Lord the next morning in front of his wife and said, How did I ever not do this? And she just started crying. I don't know, we've been praying for you for 30 years. <laughs> so, and another um, a lady in our church, um, and some of you might have heard this story already, and this was just a few weeks ago, um, there was a lady that gives me a haircut once a month that works in Spokane, one of those haircut places. And so when I when I go and I talk to people and hang out with people, I always want to listen to who they are. I'm interested in who they are. I don't want to blab and, and why are they Jesus? I don't, I don't do that at all. I actually get to know them and, and say, hey, what's going on? Who are you? And she's, she cut my hair two or three times. And so I kind of heard her tone of voice, her story, she had some little pain in her life, and, and I heard some things that she said that she's going to some grief counseling with her cousin who goes to the church. So I knew that she had a little bit of church experience, not much at all. So I just eventually just said, hey, you know what? Um, I, if you're going to come to our church, it's a small church, a family church. Uh, there's a lot of ladies that would just love on you. I didn't say you need to say it or anything like that. So she came to church. She came to church the next week. And I, it might have been this sermon that I wanted to Romans 6. She gave her life to the Lord. Someone came up to her in our church. Um, actually, a lot of you guys know who Mike Patani is. And Mike and Pam. And gave her four very specific words of knowledge that was going on in her life. And she's just sitting there going, she had a choice. She could have said, you guys are absolutely freaks. Who told you this stuff? What are you guys doing? What are you doing? Or she just knew that God was speaking to her. She gave her life to the Lord that day, marched down to the river, and we got baptized that day at the church. I mean, it was just amazing. So the, I'm just letting you know, no one is out of reach. Do not just get discouraged. You keep praying, you keep praying, you keep loving. You just keep visiting, you keep loving people. And the key is that we let God do the work, right? All the stuff on the inside, all the stuff, the past stuff, and the hurts, the pains, the unforgiveness that going through. Eventually, God just weaves through all of that and gets to their understanding and their psyche and their spirit world, whatever that is, and they begin to click. Maybe there is something real there, and it, and it just happens. So just be encouraged. So let's read. Um, again, this is the New Living Translation, so if you have King James or New King James, I, I don't even know if it would be worth reading along. You might want to just listen. Um, I tried to do it New King James. It was like, oh, I can't even read this. I'm going to try a new one here. So here we go. It's verse, um, I believe I'm starting in verse 14 in Romans 7. So this is the Apostle Paul. It says, so the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for what I want to do, what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I'm not the one doing the wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. 
And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing the wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. <clears throat> I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I end up doing what is wrong. Can anybody relate to that? I knew we all could. And I, we could relate to Paul, right? I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin and is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ the Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So there's a lot to unpack there. I will say this. Um, if you ever want to just turn the page in your Bible and read Romans chapter 8, it gives you all the answers on how to do it. This is just not, this is not how to do it, and I'll touch on it at the end. Now, there are several theories. Um, again, talking about stuff that some of you might be interested in, that's totally fine. But if you go and study the best theologian in the world who wrote the best commentaries on the book of Romans, there's actually several different theories on what was Paul talking about. He's the Apostle Paul. The dude can't sin, right? <laughs> I mean, the thought process is like that. He wrote 13 books in the Bible. How in the world would Paul ever say something like this? And what does he mean by it? So it's important that we kind of understand it. So one of the theories is that Paul is describing his pre-Christian life as a Pharisee. Well, that's one theory. That's one theory. Um, another one is that he's um, talking about a carnal Christian or an immature Christian that needs more sanctification or needs to mature a lot more. Another one is talking about the entire human race. And you don't um, have the power to do the obviously doesn't have the power to do this right. So I don't want to get too much into the theories, but there are, when, it, when it, someone studies this out way smarter than me, and there are Greek scholars and Hebrew scholars and all this kind of stuff, they do make the mistake of thinking, well, I wouldn't do that, or I would do this. See, a good scholar or a good teacher has to take all that out of the picture and just say, what does the scripture say? And that's hard because we do have opinions, right? Being raised this way or raised that way and all sorts of different things. Um, so the verse talks about, the section of the scripture talks about the here and now. It doesn't talk about Paul's past life. Um, in verses before this, 5 through 13, Paul actually said past tense stuff, like when we were or used to be in the flesh, or I once was alive. So in the first part of chapter 7, Paul uses very specific past tense terminology. Um, in verse 14, though, he moves to the present tense. He says, I am carnal. And now, don't let that be an excuse. I'll show you here in a second. Paul is not using the word carnal here as in, I'm a person who's a Christian who loves to go and sin. Carnal means flesh. In other words, of nature. So there's two ways to use the word carnal in scripture. Um, Paul uses this, I think, in the book of Corinthians in another place where he says they are acting carnal or they are trying to be carnal. That means they are trying to go out and do what's wrong in their flesh, okay? Paul is not saying that. Paul is saying I'm carnal, meaning that I have this nature in me, right? And I think every one of you could agree that thing's still in me, isn't it? I don't like it sometimes, but it's still in there, and we wrestle with this thing with our um, sin nature. People, some people don't like to call it the sin nature. I don't know what else to call it. Um, I'll show you in a few minutes that I really still believe. There, there are people, and I'm talking, I study a lot of people, and I'm, I just want to hit my head against the brick wall sometimes. Um, but there are a lot of major Christians now with big names that teach there's no such thing as 
sinful nature anymore. Once you're saved, it's gone. It's like, I haven't met that person yet. <laughs> but they teach it, and it, the sad thing is, it's heresy in my opinion, because what it does is it leads people down a road of thinking different thoughts than actually what the scripture is saying. Again, I won't go in too far into that. So anyway, Paul moves from past tense stuff in the same chapter to the here and now, present tense. So it's really clear Paul's talking about what he wrote this. He started with stuff, okay? So if he talked about himself in the past, why would he talk about himself in the present? To say Paul is talking about himself actually is very realistic. Have we ever been a Christian that didn't deal with sin or struggle with stuff? I don't think so. And even if you go back into the 1700s with the gentleman who wrote a lot of hymns and stuff like that, the two Wesleyan brothers, they really pushed the whole full sanctification theology of we're going to get to this place where we don't sin anymore. And, but even in their own writings at the end of their life, they admitted it was like, I don't think we ever reached that point. <laughs> even though they were really pushed that theology, they actually never came to the point where they lived it. Because it's not possible. And I'll show you here in a minute. So Paul didn't say that he's a right sinner who's always falling. He's saying that he just deals, he wrestles with this thing. Just like you and I do. Now I don't know what your guys' lives are like, but I do know that I still have to deal with this thing, thoughts and, and desires every day in my life. I have to deal with those things. They didn't disappear when I got saved in 1987. All right, so let's move on. Paul himself, in other writings, was very mindful of his sin, his nature or his ability to sin. Again, Paul never admits in Romans chapter 7 that he go and he teaches for two years in the church that he goes and kills another person or he's living in adultery. He's not saying that I'm this right sinner that I go out and do these things. He's saying I struggle just like everybody does with these two natures inside of me. So did Paul sin? Clearly he sinned. Did he go out and do things that he did when he was a Pharisee? No, because obviously he has Christ now. So it's not an excuse to go out and sin or to even go, oh man, I got the grace of God to sin and cover everything I do. That's a long thought process too. But in Galatians 5, 16, Paul says this, I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not law. I'm not going to get into what all that says. It's a whole other sermon. It's obviously in Romans as well. But Paul clearly is admitting there's a struggle in the Galatian church that he wrote to the Galatian. 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul was writing to Timothy and said this, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Not used to be Again, Paul's not saying that he's a spring sinner, but he is saying that he still deals with the sin nature. And he is a sin in the sense of that goes, but he still sins. In Romans 8.23, Paul says this. <clears throat> not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grow within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Now that's very interesting that Paul says that in Romans chapter 8, because in Romans 7 that I just read you, there's a struggle. Now, what does the Bible teach that it wants our mind to become like the mind of who? Christ. Christ. That's what happens when we're born again. Our mind, spirit, is transformed, and from that time on the rest of our life, our mind is supposed to become more like Christ. And the more our mind becomes more like Christ, the more our actions are going to become more like Christ. Because that's how the conversion and the, and the maturing process goes. But there's still this thing in us that struggles and wrestles against that thing. So Paul's saying in chapter 8, 
eagerly, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. So think about this. Paul's saying, I believe, that my body is still waiting for its redemption. My mind's been redeemed. I have the Spirit of God in me. My body still, well, what's going to happen in the last day? The resurrection, right? You're going to get a new body. You're going to get a, a body that's going to be like Christ, so you will never have to deal with that sin nature anymore. And that's what his, his, but his body, just like the earth, creation is eagerly waiting and grumbling for that. So his body was doing that as well. In verses, in what I just read to you, in verses 17 and 20, um, it says, But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Um, that was 17. And then 20 says this, It is no longer I who do this. So Paul is saying there's a struggle here in what's going on. It's not I, anyone that's doing it. So before salvation, I was, I was before I got saved, and I, I can remember clearly, you know, it was in 1987, and some of you in here can agree with me. Um, I, I like the sin. I agree with the whole sin nature thing inside me. And guess what? My mind that was not converted to Christ, my mind did not have the Holy Spirit. However you want to imagine that, your heart, your mind, your spirit, being transformed, being, being a new creation in Christ Jesus. Both my mind and my body was like, yes, we're doing this. Okay? Anybody remember that? That's who we were. Okay? But now, in Christ Jesus, your spirit, your mind, however you want to cycle that in your, in your mind so you understand what the Bible's saying is at war against the other part of your will that wants to go out and do things that you shouldn't do. And again, we all struggle with that, or at least go through the process of struggling with that. I don't know if Abby does. <laughs> now check this out. This is cool. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says this, another, another Paul letter. Among whom also we all once, so that's everybody, conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. So that describes everybody. Everybody before Paul, everybody after Paul. Once we sin and rebel against God, both our mind and our body, our sinful nature, want to fulfill that will. Now also in here, the word desire, when it says um, ourselves in the flesh, or um, lust in the flesh, fulfilling the desires, that desire actually in the Greek word means the will. So you and I willed with our mind or our spirit, and our body to sin because we were children of wrath. Mm -hmm. That make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. So desire here means as sinners, we were fulfilling both wills, the mind and the flesh. But as Christians now, we now choose to fulfill the will of the mind, but our members or our flesh still wants to fulfill the will of sin. There was no conflict as a sinner, but now as a child of God. You're all a child of God, but if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, there's this conflict. There's this conflict. So I've always had two wills, but now I have control over one, and the other one I'm gradually the flesh subduing in, because Paul also teaches us what? Crucify that flesh, because it's ugly. It's, it's nasty. It's gross. And we all know the things that we can think in our heart and our mind toward people. We're not full of love all the time. Sometimes we're full of stuff which we shouldn't be full of. That's, a, that's our sin nature that wants, to, that wants to get out. So what exactly happened? Um, things changed in salvation. I now want to obey God. So when the Old Testament in, I believe, three different, at least three different places, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah talks about a new covenant. Um, the law of God can be written on your heart. Talks about those things. 
Obviously, the whole New Covenant, the whole New Testament teaches that, right? The law of God is not What does that exactly what that mean? Because God did not sit there with a pencil and but when you receive the Holy Spirit, you now have the very nature, new creation, new nature of God, because you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the very law of God himself is in you. That's what it meant, the law of God to be written on their heart, and I will forgive them of their sins. So it's very important that we understand that. At the end of chapter 7, it talks about um, being justified. Well, Paul just said there's a struggle of two natures going on within us. How, how are we justified? How can we stand before God and be totally justified in his eyes, even though I have this nature that wants to sin? It's because we stumble. But yet, because I'm justified in Christ Jesus, I now stand on what he did and not what I do. Therefore, I am justified before God the Father, even though this morning I had to deal with thoughts uh, during worship. I had to make sure my, my mind and my heart was worshiping the Lord and, and, and declaring that he is the King and he is the Lord God Almighty. I still struggle with that, but I'm justified before God even though I struggle with the flesh, okay? So it's important to know that this wrestling thing, there shouldn't be any condemnation if you're a Christian because you are justified and you stumble along. Now, stumbling does not mean walking in sin. Walking in sin just goes, I'm done with it. I have to make a decision, I'm, I'm just gonna go back to the sin and do this. We probably all know people who did that in their life after they became Christians. Um, probably all do. Stumbling is what? You, you walk out the door and you trip, you fall on your knees, and you do what? You get back up and you continue to walk to your destination. Paul writes in, or James writes about stumbling. You get a, a righteous man falls or stumbles seven times and does what? gets back up. There is this stumbling that we do, but that stumbling does not condemn you. It just means that you're still working, right? You're still working on this maturity in Christ Jesus. Now, I want to end, um, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I just want to make it really simple. And I, I always try to uh, dumb things down for me. I just, need, I just need the simplicity of Jesus, what do you mean? I said, I just want to know what you mean. Amen. Um, so how do we walk how do we walk out this thing called our Christian life and subdue our flesh and sin less and less and less, which I totally believe the Bible teaches that, and walk in righteousness more. Now walking in righteousness does not mean self-righteousness where we look down on people, it means that we love people more, but yet we walk in the presence of power of God. Um, first of all, Romans chapter 8, walking in the Spirit. Romans 8 gives you all the answers to overcoming the flesh. We walk in the Spirit. That's number one. I'm not going to get into that because it's the next chapter. You can go read that. The power of the Spirit, Romans chapter 8, number 2, the Word of God. Now, as Christians, um, for 36 plus years now, I've heard all those 36 years, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Get in the Word. Get in the Word. There's nothing like it. And there's nothing like it when you take the Word and the Spirit of God and mix those two, which they are one and the same when it comes to the Spirit of the Word, and that will help you more than anything. Now, there's a story in Deuteronomy chapter 7. I don't know if um, how familiar you are with it. I'm just going to read it really quick. It's just a few verses. Deuteronomy chapter 7, I believe it's verse 18, it starts. It says, when he is talking about the future king of Israel, okay? So any king of Israel that sits on the throne, this is God commanded to him. So if God commanded this for a king to rule over a whole nation, 
How much more do we choose to rule over our life? Let alone something else, whether you manage something or whatever it is, just to manage and rule over our own life. So when he sits on the throne as the king, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. He must always keep that copy with him and read it daily as long as he lives. That way he will learn to fear the Lord his God by obeying all the terms of these instructions and decrees. So, the first five books of the Bible is called the Torah, okay? He has the Hebrew name for it. And um, Moses wrote it. There's a lot of instruction. Most of you have read through the first five books. Some of it's really cool. Some of it can get really boring when you get into Leviticus and so forth. But Paul, or God said this directly to Moses. When a king sits on my throne, kingdom of God on earth. That person is going to sit and just pretend that you guys are the Levitical priests of Israel. So the king, David or Solomon or whoever it was, is going to come and sit down in front of you and take the Torah and rewrite it in front of you every day of his life and read it every day of his life. Therefore, he will do what? Fear the Lord his God. Mm -hmm. If God said he had to do that in front of the Levitical priesthood, and it goes on, we read the rest of it, it's important as well, <clears throat> that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by obeying the terms of his instructions and the decrees. This regular reading, check this out, Put your name in this now. This regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. So even thousands of years ago, God's heart for God was supposed to be the king with the people who fell again and said we want a king. But God's heart for a king to rule over his kingdom. Israel, the nation of Israel, was supposed to be a kingdom of priests. God's heart was that that king would never, for one second, think that he is above any Israelite or any Levitical Israelite. He was an equal. It was his calling by God to be a king. It was a role that he played, but his heart was to be, we are equal. I do not rule over this kingdom and think that I'm above any of my Israelites, fellow Israelites. That's important. So put your name in that. <clears throat> this regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud, from turning away from the commands in the smallest way, and it will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations in Israel. Clearly that didn't happen, did it? They messed it up. All the time. The, I think there were 17 or 18 uh, when the kingdom split, and there were 10 northern tribes and two southern tribes, and the northern in northern Israel, the 10 tribes. I think 18, 17 or 18 of the kings, not one of them was ever righteous. But clearly they didn't do this. They didn't even think about the word of God. They didn't even think about what God's instructions were anymore. But if they would have sat down in front of the Levitical priesthood every day and wrote down the Torah. Word for word, how much conviction would have been in that man's heart? Mm -hmm. Even though he lived in the old covenant, he still would have been convicted every day, and he would have wrote things that would have said, Oh, my goodness sakes, I'm a sinner. I cannot treat people like this. Or I have to stop doing this because the word of God says this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we got to walk in the Spirit. In the Word of God, but those two have to go in. They're not separate from that thing. They're the same thing in the sense of what's going on. So every time I read the Bible, it's, it's always, Lord, what do you want me to get out of this? That maybe I haven't gotten before, or show me something that I'm doing, or an attitude, whatever it is. It was funny just the other day, I think it was yesterday morning, coming back from our hike from feeding our pets up in the mountains. Even Arlen said, we were talking about 
to a million people, and a lot of them said, even if we don't watch it, what's going to happen? Any one of us has the ability to walk in pride, and arrogance, and bitterness, and unbelief. Every one of us has the ability to do that unless we are in the Word of God. And the third thing that prevents us from fulfilling the flesh and not fulfilling the, the spirit or um, the mind of Christ in us is the body of Christ. There's so many scriptures in the New Testament that say, spur one another on. Pray for one another. Love one another. Serve one another. The body of Christ will never be diminished in the world. We look at our world right now and we go, oh my gosh, Jesus come back. I don't ever say that. <laughs> the more turmoil, the more light we get, the more power we get. Let, let us never think. When God comes back, we're not going to have any choice but matter anyway. So why do we even for one second cry out to God and say, God, just come back, please? No. <laughs> I'm saved. I want others to get saved before we end this thing. Don't ever have an attitude of, oh God, please come back tomorrow. No, we got way too many people to save. There's way too many souls out there that are completely lost and have no, no connection with God at all. That's why we're here. If God just wanted to end it all, we would just all be in heaven right now. But he doesn't want to do it yet. Someday he will, I don't know what day it is. But until then, the body of Christ is always going to become more powerful. If we do what the Bible says. So when you go back and we're in this read, uh, hopefully that, that makes sense out of Romans 7. Because some people make Romans 7 uh, an excuse to sin. Now, we're just going to wrestle with the flesh, so we might as well just go headlong in, right? No, no, no. There's nothing in Scripture that Paul teaches in all his 13 books that would say, yeah, just go ahead and go sin and be God's just time that. James doesn't, John doesn't, Matthew doesn't, Luke doesn't, no one does. So it's not an excuse to go sin because we know there's a struggle. It's a struggle there because we have two wills, the flesh and our mind. Now we're in control of this one because we have the law of God in our heart, our mind in our heart, we become more like Christ. But we're also supposed to subdue this one, and we subdue it by becoming, growing this one. Walking in the Spirit, knowing the Word of God, and loving each other as the body of Christ. So don't ever think we're just this group of small people because Jesus started with 12. Okay? And they just walked in the Spirit, they loved each other, and they preached the gospel, and the world got turned upside down. So the same thing's going to happen here, it's just a matter of time. There's been prophetic words over this church that give it time, give it time, be patient, keep doing what you're doing, and you're going to see souls come in. And when they come in, this reservation, this region will be turned upside down because it's going to be real. It's not going to be a name only, a Baptist name or a Catholic name or a Pentecostal name. It's going to be Jesus, Divinus, and our sight. So hopefully that makes sense a little more about Romans chapter 7 in this struggle that we have. Paul was not a ranked sinner. He was before he was saved. All he's saying is, I still struggle with the flesh, the here and now. That's all he was saying. It wasn't this thing where he was out preaching one night and going to the bar the next night. It wasn't what he was saying. He was saying, we all struggle with this. And my body groans for the day that it will be resurrected. Amen. Amen. I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you for your awesome grace over these people, Lord, over this region. Father, we just thank you that you're going to continue to pour out your love on every person in each limb to here in Kettle Falls and this whole region, Lord God. We just know we have faith, Lord God, and we know that no one is beyond the same. No one is beyond the outstretched arm of God's grace and his mercy and his love, Lord God. So, Lord, we just continue to pray for your grace, for your mercy, Lord God, for it to just be poured out upon this nation, upon this reservation, Lord God, upon this region. And we just